Ancient Egyptians closely regarded the manufactured or sculpted historical and written record as factual truth, not only in the negative sense of erasure from history, but also in the positive sense of if it is written, then it is true. And I don't mean just paid lip service or wishful thinking as we might encounter with the representation by other cultures of historical events, but I mean in a very literal way. Ramses the Great may have had an ignoble stalemate at the Battle of Kadesh after being ambushed by the Hittite army lying in wait, but he managed to rewrite the history of the matter, exclaiming how he single-handedly charged forward into the Hittite throngs, driving his valiant steeds with enemies underfoot, smiting foes left and right with godlike fury, because pharaohs just don't lose battles. Mott wouldn't have it that way. In Egyptian funerary inscriptions, we see an even greater literal interpretation of the written word as truth. Remember back in episode 2, we had a look at this wall fragment from the tomb of Amenemet, from the Egyptian Middle Kingdom. We saw how hieroglyphs are incorporated into the framework of the subject matter. The flowering reed hieroglyphic character used in place of sliced bread on the offering table, the loaves of bread, jugs of beer, and animal haunches all represented the same way they'd appear in hieroglyphic inscriptions, like we see up above. So, we see the direct incorporation of hieroglyphs in Egyptian painting. Just as with the historical examples we were just talking about, if it's written, then it's true. Not figuratively, but literally. The appearance of all these foodstuffs in essentially written form makes them true or permanent. So, even after a few generations, your great-great-grandchildren have long stopped making offerings of real bread and beer at your tomb, you still got these representations made of stone. Being written and thereby literally truthful and really real, these representations of offerings in stone can magically function in place of real physical offerings, providing the same nourishment and ensuring the continued sustenance of the soul in the afterlife. Egyptian hieroglyphs are a very potent magical language. The word hieroglyph literally means a holy carving. Hieroglyphs were largely reserved for use on sacred documents, funerary inscriptions, prayers, spells, and blessings. For everyday common written correspondence, legal documents, shopping lists, and the like, the Egyptians used something called hieratic. That is, that privileged 1% or so of the literate Egyptian populace. A hieratic is basically a highly cursive form of hieroglyphs, and so it's essentially the same language. We see some hieratic here, side by side with hieroglyphs on a fragment of the Book of the Dead from the Third Intermediate Period. Egyptian hieroglyphs are a wonderfully ornamental language. Beyond the already imaginative use of mundane objects from everyday life in their language, the Egyptians also included themselves, that is, different human figures and human body parts, in addition to a whole panoply of exotic and wild creatures, scores of different birds, beasts of burden, and dangerous ferocious animals like horned vipers, wasps, vultures, and carrion beetles. And remember, in Egypt, the written word is true, so much so that the bread and beer and funerary feasts figuratively emerge from the scene of, to offer their nourishment to the deceased. So what's holding back the horned vipers and scarab beetles? We sometimes see the Egyptians expressing a sort of fear that the ferocious beasts depicted among the hieroglyphs might actually come to life and spring out of the inscriptions. The horned vipers might jump out and sink their venomous fangs into you. Ducks and geese could flutter forth and gobble up the bread left behind for the deceased. And scarab beetles may crawl out and burrow into the mummy itself. To prevent this from happening, we occasionally see something we call ritual mutilation of hieroglyphs. We might see the depiction of a little knife driven into the head of the horned viper, thereby killing it. Or we could see a duck, but it wouldn't have any feet, so it's not a whole, complete duck, a true duck. It doesn't conform to Mott, so it won't run the risk of springing to life. It all comes back to Mott. But it's still legible and functional for the purpose of the inscription. So what's all this got to do with why the Egyptians represented the human form the way they did on a two-dimensional surface? Well, let's take apart the human form, in a manner of speaking. The head is clearly in profile yet we see two shoulders as though seen frontally. The chest is somewhat in between, with the front breast seen frontally and the rear breast seen in profile. From the hips on down, the body's pretty much in profile. Interestingly, we always see two legs, whether they're standing or sitting. 
there's always, at the very least, a hint of a second leg peeking out from behind the front leg. We also always see two arms. If the figure were drawn the way we're taught in grade school to draw someone from the side, we'd only see one shoulder and one arm, the other being hidden behind, and we'd only see one leg in front, the other one also hidden in back. So, why this contortion of the human form? Well, remember, to the Egyptians, if it's written, then it's true. True and eternal. Compare the painted human figure with the hieroglyph of a man. The Egyptians represented people in their art, the same way they were written in their language. The human form in art is essentially a large version of the hieroglyphic human form, just as we saw the grave goods piled on Amenemet's offering table. And remember the ritual mutilation of hieroglyphs that we were just talking about, where the horned viper might be ritually slain by a knife driven into its head, or the truth or mat of a duck would be ritually nullified by not representing its feet? So here on the mummy case of Panachanmun, if Panachanmun were represented quote-unquote realistically in profile with just one arm and one leg visible, forever here on after, poor Panachanmun would be hobbling around with just one leg and one arm in the afterlife. The Egyptians are essentially representing the salient characteristics that they considered to make up human physiology, that they considered critical for existence in the afterlife. It's prescribed by Mott that the human form be represented in this manner. As a little curious aside, although the head's shown in profile, the eye's seen frontally as though it's staring out of the scene, but it's not. Panchanamun and Horus are clearly engaging with Osiris, not with us. If the subjects of a work of art are meant to interact with each other, the Egyptians create a two-dimensional painting or relief carving. If the subjects meant to interact with us, the viewer, the Egyptians would use a statue meant to be seen fully frontally. Another curiosity in Egyptian painting and relief carving is seen in the feet. You never see little toes. It's as though you're looking at the insides of both feet at the same time, and you see only the big toe and the arch of the foot. Odd, huh? And that, children, is a story for another time. <laughs> <laughs>